All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having thank, thank, having me here. Thank you for uh, uh, staying so far and not giving up. We're just getting started here. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for organizing. Thank you, uh, Kimberly and Karen, for also helping organize locally and, and setting up all these. I was admiring all the pamphlet work and things that they helped set up with our marketing team. And uh, it's, it's really cool. So thank you all so much. Um, so I'm going to talk today about artificial intelligence. I was asked to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, so I will talk about what I know. I suspect that some of you in the room uh, have knowledge of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence practices that I don't know about. And I think it would be useful uh, as, as I uh, finish up to have a little bit of discussion about those. And I think some of the sessions later today, there'll be opportunities to continue having this discussion ar around this topic because I see this as a key issue for people um, doing psychological assessment and think that this will be a key issue for us in the future. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I'm very lucky. Uh, these are the people I get to work with on a daily basis. Uh, it is the most talented team I've ever worked with. Uh, these people have uh, PhDs and masters in IO psychology. Uh, I myself get to learn a lot from them because my PhD is in personality psychology. Does anybody else? Is anybody else a personality psychologist? Okay, there's, so there's a few of us in here, but most of us, I think, are IOs. Um, and so um, I'm very fortunate because uh, this crew gets to uh, teach me all kinds of things. And much of the stuff that I get to talk about when I go give talks like this is because of all the hard work that they did. I just get to stand here and take credit for it. So um, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about today? This is the uh, truth in advertising slide. So first we're gonna define some terms so that we can all at least know what I'm talking about when I'm saying something. Some of these terms you may already be familiar with, but just so that we can all be on the same page. Uh, second, I'll talk about what are some of the things that AI has promised us. Third, I'll talk about what we know from AI right now. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about what I think is the future of AI in terms of psychological assessments. So a common term that we see in our world, I'm sure you run into it all the time, is the term big data. If we look at definitions of big data, there's more than one out there. These are two of the more popular ones. The first one is mostly used by computer scientists, data sets that are too large or complex for traditional data processing. Um, I actually don't quite know what that means. What, what is considered traditional data processing? I don't know. Um, so this one's actually, to me, is pretty vague. I think folks like us, when we think of big data, it's more about the second definition here, um, extremely large data sets that we can use to real, uh, reveal complex patterns, right? So um, that's what I think is the big data for the, for the assessment world for us is this kind of big data. In particular, we're trying to understand human behavior, job performance, um, using lots and lots of data. Another term that, and this is ostensibly what this talk is about, that, that comes up in our world or has come up in our world more and more often is artificial intelligence. Again, there's more than one definition. Um, one is intelligence demonstrated by machines. So this could be robots. You may have seen videos of robots like picking up boxes and moving boxes and climbing up stairs and things like that. Um, but another, a broader definition is any, any device that can perceive its environment and then take actions that maximize its chances of achieving a goal, right? And so one example of that, if you may have seen this, uh, I'll show this video here, is, um, is this thing that Google has introduced. Obviously, this is a, uh, a really good example, but if you haven't seen it, um, hopefully the sound, if it's, I'll try to make it as loud as I can. So, actually calling a real can you hear in the, I can't make it any louder. <laughs> oh, maybe I can't. Sure, what time are you looking for around? 
We do not have a cell scan available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service she would be looking for. Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day, bye. So, uh, this was a Google Assistant calling to book a haircut. And this, so this is you just telling your phone, okay, go book me a haircut between this time. And then it does it. It just calls the salon and sets it up on its own. And what's really amazing about it is, um, well, what's amazing about this clip, I think, are several things. One is that the assistant doesn't sound robotic, right? It sounds human-like. It does things like, uh, do you have anything around 10? Like something that a human would do, not a robot would just say, do you have anything around, right? So there's that part. But then the other part is that its ability to react to questions that you might not have anticipated, right? So some of the questions that the, the hair salon person asked were like, oh, uh, surprised that it could respond to that and answer the question in a way that, again, maximized the chance of actually getting the haircut appointment at the time that the person wanted, okay? So this is one example from Google, but this is just an example of artificial intelligence and the kinds of things that we're talking about when we're talking about AI. We're talking about getting computers to do things for us. Um, let's see if I can keep going. Okay, so big data, artificial intelligence. The last one we'll talk about is machine learning. Machine learning is really a part of artificial intelligence. So if we look at uh, the, what the computer scientists, when they talk about artificial intelligence, they see artificial intelligence as a broad category of things. Machine learning is a subcategory. Um, and it's basically statistical techniques that uh, allow you to build algorithms, right? So we're building algorithms to predict some outcome or make some kind of uh, prediction or data-driven decisions. Now, it's a little bit different from data mining. Uh, data mining is more about emphasizing knowledge discovery. Right, so whereas machine learning, we typically, in fact, these two fields, we often think of them as the same. I think people in our world do, but people in the computer science world disagree with us. They think they're very different. They even have different conferences. They only have one conference where they all come together. Otherwise, they all go off to different places. Um, the uh, machine learning, you typically have some outcome that you know about, and you're trying to improve, that, improve the prediction of that outcome or you know about relationships, you're just trying to make them stronger. With data mining, it's usually trying to find relationships that you didn't even know existed, right? So again, from, from our standpoint, this is, we often think of these as pretty equivalent. Um, for, for people in those worlds, they think of them as quite different. Okay, so that's a little bit of definition of terms um, and the kinds of things we're talking about today. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief history trust me, it'll be very brief, on machine learning and big data. Uh, typically, when we talk about these topics or any kind of thing on artificial intelligence, uh, we talk about Arthur Samuel. Uh, Arthur Samuel actually coined the term machine learning. He was uh, an MA in electrical engineering from MIT. And then he worked at Bell Labs during World War II, mostly uh, developing vacuum tubes and improvements in radar. And then after that, he started, uh, he went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and started the ILLIAC project. He actually didn't stay there through the finish of it, so he got it going, and then he left because uh, IBM offered him a job, and he started working for IBM. And um, he's perhaps most well known for building a checkers program on the IBM 701. Um, this was a really big deal because this was a checkers program that was quite good. If you were a novice, it would beat you. If you were uh, an amateur, it would be um, highly competitive with you, right? So amateur chess players were pretty good. It could do well in amateur chess competitions. It had a good chance of winning that competition. Professional chess players, or checkers players rather, uh, not so much. Uh, they, they would still beat it. But the point was this was so good at checkers that overnight, IBM stock price increased by 15 points because of this program, because people went and said, wow, look what IBM can do. Um, a key contribution from this is uh, alpha beta pruning. 
using the Minimax algorithm. So the Minimax algorithm, for those of you who might not be familiar, it is actually works really well in games like checkers. So the game of checkers is it evaluates a position. Here's where the checkers are on the board. And it says, um, what are the chances that I, what, what, I want to maximize my chances of winning and minimize your chances of winning. And so it says, which is the next best position to do that? And it tries to find the position that does that. And so it has an evaluation tool uh, that says this is a, a better chance of winning than this one, so I'll move here, right? Now the problem is, in a game like checkers, okay, I have to think about if I move here, then you move here, and pretty soon we start branching out into lots and lots of deep uh, levels, right? So the, you can think of each of these moves as branches. Um, even in a game like checkers, you might think, well, it's a pretty simple game. There are so many branches that it becomes really complicated. What alpha beta pruning did, what Arthur Samuel's invention did, was say, if that's a branch is looking bad after like the first move or the second move, stop looking down that branch. Don't go down there any further. Right? So we can look deeper down more promising branches and just give up on ones that didn't look promising right away. And this was a big deal. This was a major advancement in uh, the Minimax algorithm and how these work. So uh, how has that worked today? Well, perhaps you've heard of uh, um, uh, Google's DeepMind lab, uh, and they created this uh, deep learning uh, Go uh, machine. Right, so AlphaGo. Uh, this was really interesting because AlphaGo uh, destroyed Lee Sedol um, quite badly in the game of Go, um, and is Lee Sedol who is the best? He was the best Go player in the world, uh, and it beat him quite badly. And um, it made moves that humans hadn't really thought of before. Right, it completely changed. Like we thought, oh, we've kind of reached the limits of knowledge about Go and what are the best strategies, uh, AlphaGo showed that, no, that's not true. There were way deeper moves that it was making that humans had not, that didn't even seem to make sense to humans. Now they do. Now that we've seen them, we go, oh, actually, now I see what it's up to, and that actually makes sense, right? So this trained, uh, this, this basically retrained the way humans think about Go. A similar thing has happened uh, in chess with uh, DeepMind's AlphaZero. So the way this works is the same way, uh, the same way that AlphaGo was built. Um, these just play each other, right? So you know the rules of chess, and now you're a computer, right? You know the rules, and you know the objective, and now just play. And you play the first game, and they just make kind of random moves, and then there's a winner, and it learns. And then you play another game, and then there's a winner. So uh, they trained AlphaZero on something like 9 million games. Play yourself 9 million times. Right? And you just try to get better by, well, oh, last time I made that move, that was really bad. I lost that game. And it just tries to get better and better. And uh, then they put it up against the best computer engine in the world, which is known as Stockfish, which is an open source computer engine for chess. I know you're all very excited about chess because you know the World Chess Championships going on right now in London, of course. Today's a, an off day. I know you all know that, so we're excited for what, the, what will happen tomorrow. Um, but if you don't know, it's actually kind of a big deal. There's an American in the final, and they're like, if he wins, he'll be the first American to win since Bobby Fischer. So anyway, all right, but nobody's paying attention to that except me. That's fine. Um, so Alpha Zero played against Stockfish and won 23. They played 100 games. It won 23 games with the white pieces, three games with the black pieces, and the rest of the games were draws. In top-level chess, that is an absolute beating. I mean, that is just getting destroyed. Um, the two players that are playing right now in the World Chess Championship have played four games, and they've all been draws, which is very common at top-level chess, right, that, that people will draw with each other a lot. So to get beat 26 to 0 to, uh, to 74 ties is a, real, is a real beating. And this was a totally different kind of system from uh, the top chess engines. The top chess engines just look really deeply. I forget what it is. I think it does something like hundreds of thousands of positions per second it analyzes, right? Whereas Alpha Zero only analyzes something like 40,000 positions per second. Its moves look human-like. 
Bobby Fischer famously talked about how he could beat a computer because all you had to do was sacrifice pieces and a computer would always take the pieces and be in a terrible position and then you would checkmate the computer. It was very easy, uh, it was different, a different time. Computers can search much deeper now. Uh, computers are better than all humans now, that's, that's a given. But the fact is that AlphaZero was even better than the best computer because it made human-like moves. It sacrificed pawns, which is extremely unusual for computers, right? So when we're talking about artificial intelligence and advances in artificial intelligence, uh, this is an interesting place to keep an eye on because game-based uh, methods are it's really nice because we have an objective outcome. It's really clear what we're trying to maximize. Um, and it seems to be happening. So, okay, what does that have to do with psychological assessment? Well, I would argue that the history of psychological assessment is actually not that someone earlier said a lot of what I'm doing is what they call artificial intelligence, a lot of what I've been doing. In fact, the history of psychological assessment, I would just pick three things, um, not so much at random, um, is about maximizing prediction, right? So the MMPI was founded by saying, well, we want to maximize the prediction. We don't really care which items it is. We just want to maximize the prediction between people with this clinical uh, diagnosis and people without it, right? Uh, the CPI, the same way, except for normal types of behaviors. And our HPI here at Hogan, uh, the same idea, except workplace performance, right? So the original HPI had over 400 items. Now it has 205 or six. Um, and why? Because, well, the items that weren't very good, we don't need those anymore, right? Let's keep the ones that predict, that, that actually predict performance. And so psychological assessment's been doing this just on a much smaller scale, right? So maybe the samples that were building the MMPI were much smaller than, say, 9 million chess games like they might, like Alpha uh, Zero might play against itself. But the idea is the same, right? We're trying to maximize um, our predictive performance. Um, so the promise here is this, or at least this is what we're starting to see in uh, modern assessments. So a friend of mine, Chris Sumner, some years ago published a paper looking at how we can measure your personality from social media. This one was using Twitter. Uh, they had about almost 3,000 people. No, you don't have to. I feel bad. You don't have to read the whole, uh, that's not, the point is, isn't to read it. Uh, the, this is a real paper, that's the point. Um, uh, they had about 3,000 people uh, take personality assessments. They took the dark triad personality assessments. Um, and then they said, give me your Twitter handle, and I will review all of your tweets. And then they just looked at the words you used on Twitter and could predict, uh, built predictive models. For, uh, for your dark triad scores, right? So now we know which words you use that predict uh, dark triad scores on Twitter. And then we can apply this to millions of people on Twitter. So we can do things like figure out where the psychopaths live, for example, or are tweeting from. Um, we've done similar work, I've done similar work with, with some of my former students, uh, myself at using this exact same approach. Right, where you, you uh, grab a bunch of data on Twitter and you get people to take some assessments, you line them up, and then you use those new algorithms to, uh, to predict um, other, other, all kinds of things. Like we found out that it turns out uh, really bad stuff happens after midnight. Like kind of what your mother always told you. Right? So that's, that's one area in looking at personality from social media. Another couple of friends of mine, uh, Michal Kozinski, uh, who you may know from CNN and various other news outlets, and uh, David Stilwell. Uh, these folks uh, uh, were the founders of the Psychometric Center in Cambridge, and they created an app called My Personality. This was a very popular person, uh, app on Facebook. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, this was back in the wild, wild west days of Facebook where anybody could create an app and just put it on there, and then you could just start collecting data. Um, and so they had people take uh, really good personality assessments, and then they had access to all of the things that they liked on Facebook, their Facebook profiles, um, their uh, profile pictures, any of that kind of information they, they had access to when people agreed to, com to complete their assessments. Millions of people did this. And they've shown that the things that you like on Facebook um, predict whether you're single versus in a relationship, whether your parents are still together at age 21, whether or not you smoke, drink alcohol, use drugs, 
They can predict race. They can predict if you're a Democrat or Republican, gay, lesbian, and gender with remarkable levels of accuracy just from the things that you've clicked like on on Facebook. And that's not just, oh, I clicked like on a, on a company or something like that. That's also liking friends' posts, right? Certain friends' posts that you've liked and the contents of those posts. They can grab all of that and use that information to predict these kinds of demographic characteristics about you. The gay and lesbians really interesting because they've also shown that you can do that with people's faces. Yes, I can take a picture of your face and have a pretty good guess as to whether or not you are gay or lesbian just from the profile picture of your face. Grabbing, uh, it, what it basically does is it turns your face into um, uh, some 100,000 data points and then they just say, well, can we predict this or not? And they can. Um, and another uh, related study from the same lab, uh, uh, a similar kind of study looked at how well we can judge your personality. That is, how well can a computer, looking only at your Facebook likes, judge your personality? And so what they had the, the computer do was take all of your likes and try to predict big five personality traits. And they compared that to sort of known judgments, right? So, uh, so the big five are going to try to, or the, the Facebook likes, the computer is going to try to predict what you say about yourself. And we're going to compare that to what other people say about you, like how much other people agree with you. Okay, so it turns out uh, your work colleague and you, uh, that correlates about 0.27. So what you say about you and your work colleague, this is an average across all of the big five traits, correlates about 0.27. Okay, that's um, less than 10 likes. Less than 10 likes, things that you've liked on Facebook, with just that information alone, the computer can do better than your work colleague at predicting what you say about yourself. What about close friends? Well, they do about 0.45. That's somewhere between 60 and 70 likes. What about uh, a spouse? A spouse is the best one. That's about 0.58. You need about between 250 and 300 likes. And then the computer can uh, generate a personality score for you that is uh, is similar to what you say about you is what your spouse says, right? And so they concluded that the uh, computer uh, knows you uh, better than your spouse or your friends. So what is the really big idea or ideas here? Um, I think there are two big ones. One is automated personality assessments, right? That we can take information that you have on LinkedIn. I haven't even talked, there's other stuff too, and I know some of you in the room know about it. There's other things that grab data from LinkedIn. Uh, we can take a look at your Google search history. Um, and we could predict your personality from that. Number two is the kind of stuff that HireVue is talking about, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is uh, getting data from you in a digital interview. Right, so I think these are the two big ideas. One is automated personality assessments from social media or internet profiles. Number two is digital interviews. That is, you uh, respond to prompts on a screen. There's some prompt and you just talk through like you were talking on an interview. You might even just pre-record an interview without a prompt. And what this will do is it will do things like measure all these micro expressions on your face where your eyebrows move and your, how wide your eyes open and how big your smile is and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, it will measure your tone of voice. It will measure a whole bunch of other voice parameters, uh, how quickly you speak, um, then the actual content of what you say. Right? We can measure the actual words that you're using and put all of that information together to build a profile for what you're like to identify the jobs that you would be best for and to predict how well you're going to perform in those jobs. So these are the really big ideas and the, the promise of what artificial intelligence is offering us. Okay, part three. What do we actually know, right? So that's what, what we're told is coming. What do we actually know? Um, well, for sure, we know we can take these social media things, and I've also added resumes here. We can take that information, give it to a computer, and get results from an assessment. I can predict the things that you say about yourself on an assessment, 
from those kinds of things. We know that. But there's some things that we don't know. Does it predict reputation, for example? Well, in that study that Kozinski and Stillwell were part of, um, a little known table, supplemental table two, which uh, you're welcome that this table exists. I was a reviewer on this paper and I said, uh, what about this? And then supplemental table two is what it appeared in the paper after I told them you need to talk about this. Um, looks at the correlation between uh, various things, right? So we've got self-reports, we've got computer, what the computer thinks about you, and then we've got what other people think about you. We've got all three of those pieces of information. How do they overlap? Well, it turns out that what your friends say about you and what the computer knows about you from your Facebook's likes don't actually overlap that much. Those are the top two correlations here. When we control for self ratings, they're 0 0.08, 0 0.07, 0 0.04, 0 0.03, 0 0.08. That is what the computer says about you and what your friends say about you doesn't overlap that much. They're both accessing different parts of what you say about you. Now, we could interpret that Facebook study, this, the computer knows you, right? That's how it was actually advertised. I, I heard it after it was published. I heard it on the radio. Uh, a computer knows you better than your friends do. Well, that's one way of interpreting that study. But another way of interpreting that study is we gave you a self-report of your personality. And then we watched how you behaved on Facebook. We watched the things that you liked. That is, we looked at your preferences, right? If you liked chilies or if you liked curly fries or something like that, we measured that. And is it really a surprise to find out that the things you say about yourself on a personality assessment predict the things that you do or the things that you like or the things that you prefer? I don't think anybody in this room would be surprised to find that out, right? So on the other hand, we could look at this and say, wait, there's not really any news there. Now it was looked at as big news, and I think in part because of the automaticity of it, right? Because we can automatically do these assessments. But when we look at how it actually correlates with what other people say about you, eh, pretty weak. Other things that we don't know about. Do computer-based assessments predict performance? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 What makes the difference? Uh, if it's, uh, so I'm repeating the question for anybody who's listening. So, uh, what makes the difference uh, from reputation versus what you say about yourself, right? So, uh, what we say about ourselves is in part based in uh, what we do, but it's also in part stuff that we make up about ourselves, right? So, whereas what other people say about us is all based on what we do. Like other people see us do stuff and they go, that's what this person's like. Yeah. So what we say about ourselves is in part stuff that we do, but it's also in part a story we make up about ourselves or, a, or maybe even ideal self, what we would like to be like. Whereas reputation is really what we do, what other people have seen us do. So at least at Hogan, we care more about reputation. Isn't, isn't reputation also what other people say about what you do? Exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. Yes, this is exactly what I suggested they do, and they didn't do that. So they didn't listen to me. So one, because I don't want to derail you, but I just did a deck review with my higher degree program. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 blog study of now is the rally around the Facebook effect, right? And so this my like the study that we're talking about. I'm positioning myself better than I am now. Yeah. Uh huh. Thinner, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 So that's what you're kind of teaching, you, right? Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. I mean. Yeah. So, so I want to say the answer to that is partly true, but I actually think I'm going to come to some of this in a little, in a little bit, but. I, exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we use self-reports at Hogan too, just like everybody else. But we would admit 
We would much rather have what other people say about you. It just turns out that's a lot harder and more expensive to get. Sure, that's true too. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk. I want to step back from right. Does it predict reputation? To how do these um, computer-based assessments actually predict performance? Um, the answer is we don't really know, because there's almost no studies on this. Now, some of you in the room might be aware of some of you might say, oh, I know about it. Okay, then you know more than I do on it. But in the academic literature, there are virtually no studies showing that any of this stuff predicts performance. Why? Well, because as you all know, collecting performance data is hard. Yeah. And most of these people don't want to do that. It's easy to get people to fill out a self-report questionnaire, relatively speaking. Right? Collecting performance data is hard. We don't know if the things that you like on Facebook actually predicts job performance because nobody's done that study. We don't know if the things that you tweet about predict performance. Again, maybe some of you in the room will say, well, I do know of this study, or maybe, we're, maybe you're doing it internally, uh, but, but there's not, not a lot of public information about that. Well, that's not true. Kids aren't, but 40. Come on, everybody under 40 is a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Facebook does own Instagram. Yeah, I, so not that long ago, I was a college professor, and none of my students, uh, while they were all on Facebook, but they almost never used it. Yeah, yeah they were all on Facebook, almost never used it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, that's actually right. No, that's what they would say. That's what they would say to me. Yeah, they're all on Instagram. That's right. Uh, we have, I have some data that we collected uh, using Instagram, and we find the same kinds of patterns there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I I'm I'm with you on that for sure. So the comment here is that performance data is notoriously terrible, and and I think that's. Personally, I mean, this is getting a little bit of a side of what I'm supposed to be talking about, but personally, I think that the future, or not the future so much, but there could be a lot of work done on the performance side of improving performance. Right? We work really, really hard on the predictor side. Everybody in this room does, right? We're, we could use some more work as probably on the performance side, and I think when we look at how assessments are linked to outcomes, our problems are not so much on what we're measuring, but more on the thing that we're trying to predict. Sorry. I would, as we are, have been talking about reputation, I'm reminded of the elections last week. Mm -hmm. And I remember certain politicians speaking about the reputation of uh, the person they're opposing. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. And the media providing um, inaccurate information yeah. about who they are. Yeah. And my question is: Is the reputation um, on the internet truly yeah. representative of the individual? That's issue yeah. number one. And I think that the information someone puts on the internet is really reinforcing. Yeah. Yeah. And is, is reputation yeah. really the social role yeah. that a person has and the context yeah. around? So, the, the, if, the personality might be different than the reputation. Okay. Now, now you made me make three points. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can remember them all. One is that uh, does what people put on social media reflect what they say about themselves? The answer seems to be yes. Lots of, there's actually four or five studies on this that shows that uh, people who are. Uh, uh, Trolls on social media are actually trolls in real life. Like they're really, and, and beyond, and there's other things too, right? The social media profiles actually tend to reflect uh, actual personality profiles. So there's, uh, there's quite a bit of data on that. Um, uh, number two, I, the, the difference between reputation and whatever some true thing is, I don't think it matters for the most part. 
what matters for your career and your job is what other people think about you. It doesn't really matter so much what you think about yourself. Okay, what you think about yourself matters some, but at the end of the day, every evaluation of you, every job you ever got, every promotion you ever got, it's all about what other people think about you. Getting elected to public office is all about what other people think about you. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. What they think about you is what matters, right? And then the last point is, I'm not even sure what a true self is or a true personality is. I, I don't know, personally, I think uh, we're just all, uh, right? For Irving Goffman, the whole world is a stage, right? So we're all acting all the time. I don't even know what a true, actually, I suspect that a true self is uh, something that uh, we would all be embarrassed to reveal, if you really think about it. Okay, anyway, so we don't know about this. We don't know if these, these predict outcomes as well as self-reports because there's no data on it. We don't even know if these are more efficient. In principle, they seem more efficient. And in principle, they also seem less fakeable. I think that's one of the big attractions to computer-based assessments, is it doesn't seem like people can fake them because it's automatic, right? You're not taking a test, you're not showing up for an interview, but people have already figured out ways to try to game these systems. So there's research on resumes where people would write, so you just send us your resume, nobody looks at it, we've got a thousand resumes coming in and the computer just reads it for all the keywords and if it has the keywords, we put you in this pile, if it doesn't, we say, sorry, thanks, uh, maybe another position's right for you, right? So, so that's something that's happening. Well, people have figured that out. And so what they said is, I'll make a resume. Let me see if I can go back to the one I had up here. Yeah, like this resume here, it's, you know, it looks like a, a normal resume, but all of the white space on there, I will put keywords in white font. No human could see it. If they looked at the resume, it looks like a perfectly normal resume. But the computer reads all of that font and picks up all of the words. And people are doing this. Right, to game the systems, right? Say, put it on, I'm gonna just put all of these key buzzwords on there so that I get put into the selected profile, right? So there's this sort of arms race. Um, and and, and the, again, the notion that these aren't fakeable in some way, I don't know if that's really true, right? There's already people trying to, to beat the systems. Another big question that we don't know about when it comes to artificial intelligence is adverse impact. So many of you probably saw uh, just a few weeks back uh, that Amazon uh, got rid of a program that was using artificial intelligence to recruit people based on resumes. Now, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, I think one of our big problems is the criteria. The artificial intelligence program they were using was perfect. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It tried to maximize the outcome that they wanted it to predict. The problem was the outcome they were trying to predict was biased. It was biased against women. And the algorithm doesn't know that. It just says, hey, I'm trying to predict this outcome. If it's got a male looking name, put them in the go pile. If it's got a female looking name, put them in the no go pile. Right? That's all that it was doing. Right? The algorithm doesn't know any better. So uh, Amazon scrapped this tool because of this adverse impact issue. We don't know anything about adverse impact. Maybe a little. There's some folks who may have done some stuff on it, but mostly we don't know much about this in terms of AI and how um, this is going to impact uh, the selection industry. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up and I know I'm, I can tell there's a lot of interest here so we can have more time for questions. Where do I think the future of AI is? Um, for sure it's in marketing, for sure. Everybody's talking about AI, whether they're doing it or not, everybody's talking about it. Uh, we use artificial intelligence, we use big data, data stacks, all of these kinds of terms, whether they're doing it or not, that's mm, hard to say but everybody's using it in marketing. The other place that's related to this is neuro, right? Lots of companies now talking about using neuro, neuro plus AI, neuroscience plus AI. Uh, when you look deep at what a lot of these companies are doing, they're not actually doing neuroscience. I mean, actual neuroscience is measuring brain activity. A lot of them are just doing what we would call cognitive tasks, right? So you just do a standard cognitive task on a computer, it's measuring reaction time and things like that. They're calling it neuroscience, but it's actually not. But regardless, this is gonna be in marketing. Neuroscience, AI, big data, machine learning, that's all part of the marketing for sure. Whether or not people are actually using it for assessments, uh, harder to say. And the other big thing that we know uh, is, is gonna happen at some point is there's gonna be legal and ethical challenges to deal with. And I, I don't know what the answers are gonna be to those kinds of things. Okay, so what do I think uh, we can do? 
Certainly we can use machine learning to optimize what we're currently doing, right? So we have current assessment and selection methods. Machine learning can improve those methods. I mean, that's, we can certainly do that. We can say, well, this was the, the algorithm we were using before based on common regression. Now we might use machine learning techniques to tweak that a little bit and get a little bit better in terms of predicting. Certainly we can do that. I think that's, that's already happening. Um, we also might want to think about how artificial intelligence might be applied to the performance side. Mostly all I've talked about today is the selection side. Um, there was just an article about, uh, who was this? Uh, this was Disney using um, automated assessments on the performance side for their laundry people. I don't know if anybody saw this, like measuring how much they're folding and how much they're uh, um, washing. And it was doing, and they had a scoreboard. This is how you're doing, and your name was in green if you were meeting the expectations, yellow if you had slowed down, and red if you weren't meeting the expectations. And there was like this competition to do it all. Um, and it turns out it was like, it ended up being a huge disaster. The, the people hated it, right? Um, that this is how they're, like the pregnant women were getting lower performance, right? Probably because they had to take more breaks. People were skipping bathroom breaks. The employees weren't, weren't very happy with this. And it, and creates lots of turnover issues. Um, but we don't know, right? We don't know what the future is of AI on the performance side. Um, and I think we'll probably have to spend quite a bit of time looking at those things. And for sure, I think that the people in this room will want to be attentive to these quote unquote new assessments, right? To assessments based on social media profiles. We we'll want to know what's going on. Whether or not we get into that space, I don't know. Maybe some of you already are uh, headed that way, and that's, that's all good. But I certainly think that we're going to have to be attentive to what's going on there because it does have an impact on us. Let's say uh, you all remember when Cambridge Analytica came out, right? Uh, me, as a personality psychologist, it doesn't really paint a very pretty picture of personality psychologists, right? When you just read media headlines and things like that. When, when you dig deep into what was going on, it's not so much about personality as about uh, some other kinds of things that they were doing. But any kind of new assessment that looks, right, that, that labels itself or lumps itself in with current assessment companies and current assessment practices, right, so we're sort of all in this together, right? And if somebody else makes us look bad, we're going to look bad with them, right? So we need to be attentive to what, what other folks are doing. Okay, um, this is what I said. Lots of promises from AI. Uh, I think so far we're not quite there. We haven't reached the promise uh, that, that AI is offering, and the future is not very clear in terms of what works and what is going to be legally and ethically uh, allowable. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that would be, you know, it's the old start again, start to doubt. Yep. You know, you need if you're going to have success with artificial intelligence or anything else, yeah. you need better data. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that. I mean, at at Hogan, we can, uh, we 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 talk about, you know, how many items our assessments measure, but we can measure, we can and have measured how much time people take in between each item they answer, right? So we could say we measure trillions of data points if you start including all of these little. But most of that data is meaningless. It doesn't predict anything, and who cares about it, right? And this is one of the things that we run into with our competitors. Our competitors will say things like, we have trillions of data points. But if most of that's garbage, then what, what good is it? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's unclear why. Yeah, I'm not actually sure why they decided to, to partial that out there. That's a good question. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Uh, I'll text to Mihal when we're done and ask him if that's, and maybe we'll get an answer by the end of the day. Um, but uh, I think the bigger story is that the link between, even when we don't partial that out, even then the link between what the computer says about you and what other people say about you is it's just okay. It's, it doesn't look nearly as impressive as um, with the self-reports. With self-reports, you get 0.5s, 0.6s. It looks really quite good, but with peer reports, it, it doesn't doesn't quite uh, get there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, and that would be, that's news to me. That's not uh, anything that's, uh, as far as I know, isn't public knowledge or isn't uh, available in any sort of uh, academic outlets. Uh, any link between what we can grab from social media and what other people say about you, I'm not, I've not seen that. So I believe you, uh, I just haven't seen it. Yep. Predictive validity. It takes a number of different things to be able to put that together into yes. a well informed, well thought out, well considered selection process that can yield a better and better result. Yep. The other problem is that I think uh, gets ignored in all of this is managers are terrible at managing. Uh, there are only about 10 or 20 percent of them who are any managers mm -hmm. at all. Yes. They have no idea how to do the job. Yeah. So for years, uh, you know, people would come to me and say, well, we want to do engagement service surveys and we want to do exit interviews. And I go, hang on, that's the job of a manager. Right. If you don't know, if your employees aren't engaged, if you don't know why your employee is leaving, you're not doing your job. Yeah. That's flat out it. Yeah. So, you know, we, we try to put all these crutches and elements around to, to crutch up Yeah, uh, well, and of course you as Wow, we're in complete agreement. There was a, a recent survey of the uh, Baltimore workforce um, that showed something like 80% of uh, people uh, would take a pay cut if somebody would fire their boss. <laughs> would take a pay cut if somebody would fire their boss. 20% of the people said that they actively fantasize about killing their boss on a daily basis. 20%. Actively found. Yeah. Well, we say.